we are officially in, in correction territory, as most of your uh, viewers are already aware of. Um, looking, if you kind of look at uh, how you we can break down this correction, is that there was a like kind of a first ten percent correction that was driven by by the increase in interest rates, and now we have started the second phase of of the correction, which is one related more to the economic slowdown coming, uh, and that's the the second order impact of of the rate hikes and and then probably there will be um also expectations that we could tilt into a recession hi it's greg garner senior investment advisor at canico genuity wealth management and garner wealth management now welcome to the channel where we help you make sense of the financial world. Now, if you like our videos, have some comments, want to see future guests, please you know, drop a comment, like, subscribe, love to hear from you. Now today, I'm going to be joined by Canaccord Genuity, North American portfolio strategist, Martin Roberge. Martin, how are you? I'm good, thank you, and thanks for having me on your show. Always love having, you've always got such great insights. Now, we're, uh, we're recording this on May 5th, um, which once again has been a really a tumultuous week in the market. So probably a really good time to, to pick up because you, you just finished your institutional uh, portfolio presentation uh, for institutional clients. Can you walk through some of the main takeaways of where we see ourselves in the market right now? Yeah, we are, um, we are officially in, in correction territory, as most of your uh, viewers are already aware of. Um, looking, if you kind of look at uh, how you we can break down this correction, is that there was a like kind of a first 10% correction that was driven by by the increase in interest rates, and now we have started the second phase of, of the correction, which is one related more to the economic slowdown coming, uh, and that's the the second order impact of of the rate hikes, and and then probably there will be. Um, also expectations that we could tilt into a recession uh, next year. So this is the slowdown phase of the valuation reset uh, that we're, we're seeing. Uh, so it's the, normally the toughest one because there, this is normally when prices accelerate to the downside. But this is also um, when you got to have some munitions to eventually benefit from, from dislocation in, in price dislocations in some of the stocks uh, out there. Uh, so obviously we've, we've gone a little bit more cautious lately owing to the, uh, not only the increase in interest rates, but also the increase in, in the US dollar, uh, which is also acting as a drag on, on the US, or will be acting as a drag on the US economy this summer. So for the folks that are listening and remember 1998, pretty looks like a, a replay of that uh, for for the summer of 2022. Uh, the, ex the exception is that central banks have their hands tied up because inflation, so they cannot really come to the rescue like they did back in 98 and, and cut rates. So it's, 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 it's a challenging environment. Honestly, Greg, I've been in this business for and nearly 30 years now, and it's probably the most challenging market environment out there. Uh, and, and markets will will need to find their own equilibrium, like no rate cuts, uh, no surprising fiscal boost. The market will settle down at a level where, you know, they, there's a an, an equilibrium between buyers and, and sellers, which is normally when valuations uh, have completed their full reset unfortunately we don't think we're there yet yeah now you also talked about maybe in the fall that the pmi or even before the fall that uh, the pmi might uh, drop below 50 50. uh yeah. so that and then in conjunction you also make a point that really right now it's all about the us dollar and it's all about uh, the vix so let's yeah, talk just a little bit about that yeah the um yeah this april was a game changer like uh, um up until recently it was mostly fears related to how aggressive would be central banks uh, throughout the world. But April was a game changer to the extent that we've seen a surge in the U.S. dollar. And by 
actually by ricochet, we've seen uh, a route in emerging market currencies. And folks need to understand that the global economy is driven by emerging markets like China, India, um, and, and the likes. And they account for about two thirds of global growth. Uh, it used to be much less than that. It used to be one third in the mm -hmm. 90s. Now, because you know they've joined the, the, the World Trade Organization, uh, they've grown bigger, global, globalization forces have made them more significant players uh, in the econ in the global economy. And if their currencies are free falling, they cannot like it costs them a lot more to import what they need uh, to make their manufacturers going. And uh, as you know, most of the inputs or if you think about commodity prices, for example, it's all denominated in US dollars. So it costs them a lot of money to get their, their goods that they need to, to make their economy running. And as a result, uh, there could be some contagion whereby, yeah, we, we're still enjoying pretty good growth right now. As uh, the, the Federal Reserve said uh, lately, but unfortunately, the risk is that there's some contagion coming from uh, the, like the global economy this summer, which could have a, a significant impact on on US, US and Canadian growth. So, and the market is always forward looking. And I mm -hmm. think this is what the market is trying to price price in right now. Right. And, and, and that makes sense. Now, going back to your point that, that it's 1998 all over again, take us back there. I know I was in the business back then. Um, you were in the business back then, but let's let's kind of paint the picture of what things were looking like at that point. Yeah, we were going through the same cycle where the in 96, 97, like the economy, the, the, the global economy was really acceler accelerating fast. The Federal Reserve started to increase rate in 1997, but in 97, we started to see some emerging market economies suffering from not only the interest rate increases in the US, but also the strengthening of the US dollar. And in, in emerging markets, like companies have, they, they don't finance uh, their, their company using local debt. They use US de dollar de de denominated, de denominated debt. So if yeah. your, your, your debt in US dollar is growing because the US dollar is rising, so you, you, you need more of your local currencies to pay back your loan, your, your interest, and your capital, okay? So you, we had also that same backdrop where um, uh, there were some debt default in emerging markets because of that, you remember the Russian debt default, okay? And we had the Asian yeah. contagion, and then Asian there was long-term capital all about that time. capital, yeah. it was all related to the fact that the world, most of the corporations are financing their operations through U.S. debt, okay? All right, sorry, debt de denominated in U.S. dollars. So when you get the Fed hiking rates uh, and, and, and U.S. economy outperforming the rest of the world, the US dollar is a huge uh, beneficiary of that. And when we started to see like the, the, the cracks in emerging market currencies, the US dollar is always a flight, like a flight to quality trade mm -hmm. is a shelter. People started to put their money more into US dollar assets. And then this is that, that compounded the debt problem. So we had a cash crunch or a debt crunch. Um, and then eventually the Fed had to cut rates in, in October 1998 to really crack the dollar. And at the same time, it, it kind of uh, provided a floor on their prices and the Dixie following the rate cuts started, like the, like the US dollar tar started to weaken and then they did probably too much <laughs> of easing and that sowed the seeds of, of the, the technology bubble in 98, yeah. 98, 2000. But I don't think we're gonna get a, a bubble this time around. We we just had it uh, yeah. in, in, in technology names, so uh, we need to deflate that that bubble and 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 probably go through some economic pain uh, through throughout the rest of, of 2022. Yeah, now let's let's walk back to um, interest rates right now because with all the debt out there, you you and I have been talking over the past that. Uh, Central banks might find themselves in a bit of a box of just how how high they can raise rates. 
Um, they yeah. seem to be bound and determined right now to raise rates, um, yeah. but I, I still think they might be boxed in. What, what are your thoughts? Well, the, the, they're boxed in because there's a level of rates at which uh, the higher interest rate expense uh, will start to bite on the economy. So yeah. we haven't seen the impact yet, but look, looking at mortgage rates uh, climbing about 5% in the U.S., you all, you've already seen uh, uh, um, more uh, mortgage demand or uh, uh, demand for mortgages in the U.S. free falling. All the rate sensitive areas of the market, auto lending as well, moderating. Uh, so you, you're starting to feel the pinch of that. So eventually it's going to filter the economy through the, the, the lower PMIs that we just discussed. And, and then it will be a stabilizer. Eventually the rates will start to respond to the possibility of a recession and the recession risks will out, outweigh the inflation risks, which will eventually put a cap on treasury bond yields. Right now, rates are still rising in the market because we haven't seen yet like lower inflation numbers but the next couple of numbers should see a softening. And then also we have to wait for the lower uh, PMI or f what we call uh, fast, econ fast economic data. And yeah. th those PMIs should be declining more, more so over the course of the summer, which is why we are we have changed our, well, we, we started to add a, a bit of bonds in our port for the first time in many years, we started to add bonds in, like just slightly to our benchmark right now. Mm -hmm. But if we continue to see more, more uh, higher yields, we will, as we get closer to 50 uh, on the PMIs, we'll increase our bond bond allocation. So uh, we're doing like we're, we started to dip, dip, dip our toes. Yeah. Now, you know, looking at things right now, you know, if the 10 year treasury starts moving to like the three or three and a quarter, do you think that's probably the outside bound of what, what can happen now before you start you know, looking at a recession? And, and do you think that the central bankers are, are cognizant of that? Or uh, you know, I'm still trying to get uh, my head around what they're thinking. Yeah, no, I think they're, 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 it, it's helping them. They're not, gonna, they're not going to um, rock the boat uh, or panic on the yields, uh, understanding that it's helping them. To, to slow the economy down and eventually don't forget the it's you're not going to get supply the supply side of the economy will not change in a heartbeat okay so right. the only way to get inflation down is through the demand side of the equation so higher yields higher bond yields higher us dollar higher oil prices is ser are, are all serving their objective of reducing demand obviously trying not to engineer a recession, but I think as long as, as the economy is slowing in a uh, ordinary way, like it's, it's, it's kind of a, in a stable way. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that the yields will not really matter the, the, the central, central banks and, and they will continue with their, their own policy rates, like the short rates right. uh, will keep at, keep rising at a steady, steady path. So, so I think that the key word here is, is steady. You want a, a steady increase in, in policy rates, a steady increase in, 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 in bond yields, a steady increase in the US dollar. And if we move from steady to a spiral, this is where the risk comes. And the one risk that we have flagged in our recent report is the spiral in the US dollar. Uh, and that annoys us. That, that makes us nervous at night. Okay, and because again, what we saw in in 1998. Uh, so um, it's again like it's it's a, a tricky uh, economic backdrop out there, and we certainly urge um, uh, your listeners to you know to to have some some cash uh, reserves. Uh, uh, we know that the TSX has done very well uh, year over year. It's still, it's doing very well. Um, let's make sure that we keep some of those gains uh, in order to benefit from opportunities that could arise over the course of the next six months. Yeah. Now the other uh, last point I just want to touch 
on your going back to inflation again, we've seen commodity and hard goods inflation kind of as the first surge. But one of yeah. the things I think we were waiting for is the second half of this year to see more of the service sector inflation yeah. coming in. Are you starting to see that in your numbers right now? It's not it's not going to be transitory if yeah. we have a wage a wage spiral. And well, that's last the thing, week, right? You, yeah. Last week, the employment cost index in the U.S. kind of told us that there's a ongoing spiral out there. Um, so, and we haven't, we, we like, again, like the inflation is composed of, of two, uh, two baskets. You got the goods, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, and the services. We, when people are talking about peak inflation, they're talking probably about the peak in goods inflation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is probably coming down this summer where you you're we're seeing already like lumber prices going down used uh, cars uh, coming down as well so there are some areas of the good uh, goods inflation side where we're seeing some sequential decline the service side is two-thirds of, of the basket the cpi basket whereas the, the, the goods it's only one-third but the two-third is only probably halfway in its own cycle we're oscillating around five percent goods peak probably around 20 but you're not going to see service inflation going to 20 but we could see service inflation going to 10. and again look at hotel rooms yeah like i'm going to the rbc open mm -hmm. in, in in toronto this june yeah. i had to book a room like 750 for one like say, Single 750? bed, yeah, including oh. taxes for one night. Huh. So, <laughs> and then like maybe it's because of the everybody's booking rooms for 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 the golf uh, RBC golf tournament. But yeah, uh, my my like hotel rooms up, uh, airfares are about to go up as well. Um, if you book through our, uh, Airbnbs, fees up. Um, so. We've got the service side of the cut, like just go to the, the restaurants. Yeah. Look at the menus yeah. up huge. OK, so all the services have gone up and will probably continue going up over the course of the year. And then this is going to keep inflation sticky around where we are. Certainly in the second half of the year, this is when probably uh, we're going to see inflation reaccelerating because yeah. of the service side of the consumer price inflation basket. The key thing that I think a lot of people don't recognize is it's not just inflation, but it's inflation expectations that really once that's why inflation tends to be sticky, because once people have it in their mind that prices are going up, you know, you're going to hold up for higher wage demands and that and that kind of perpetuates and goes into that spiral that you're talking about, which yeah. is, I think, the real concern that we have here. So. Yeah, and that, and that's why, like this time around, com, com, compared to '98, um, the inflation backdrops backdrop is is tying the hands of of central bankers, not only in North America, like for the Bank of Canada, the Fed, but the ECB as well, uh, the Bank of England as well. Um, uh, well, in Japan, they have no inflation issue uh, issues right right now, and this is the, the like. There's no policy pivot whereby the ECB could decide to hike more aggressively, which could put a cap on the U.S. dollar, so re-rate the euro dollar higher mm -hmm. and send the U.S. dollar and lower. No policy pivot coming from the Bank of Japan. Uh, where they just reconfirmed last week that they are buying an unlimited amount of bonds to maintain the yields at 25 beeps, okay, at 0.25%. Yeah. But when you do that, you print money to buy your, your bonds, and that pushes your currency down. So the U.S. dollar is appreciating relative to the yen as well. And the yen and the euro represent about 70% of the U.S. dollar basket. Uh, so it's really hard to see how the U.S. dollar can come down uh, unless uh, there is like a, a recession in the U.S., okay? yeah. which is not the, 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 the our base case scenario for now. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, always good insights. Um, challenging times, but we'll get through it. We've been there before. Yeah, there, there, there are always cycles that are coming back, and the stock market is one of those cycles. Okay. Hey, thanks very All much. Right. Martin Roberge. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more content like that, please consider subscribing or join me on my website, greggorner.com. That's greggorner.com. Look forward to seeing you there.